Hi, and uh, welcome to today's show. Uh, this is Deb Cross, the uh, producer of Celebration of Life Studio, based out of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. I, uh, the topic f for today's show is um, it's the pediatric cancer cluster that has been discovered in uh, a number of seacoast uh, towns. Uh, that includes Rye, Hampton, um, Greenland, and, and Portsmouth. And it is with a very, very heavy heart that I have today to, to talk about this uh, pediatric cancer cluster in Rye. Because those of you who know me personally, uh, Rye is, um, I'm not sure I know an, anybody, well, I'm sure there are other people, who are passionate and, and love that beach as much as I do. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I, that I wrote a book. and. And I invested seven months of my life to tell the story about the way it used to be at the beach, at my beach and in, in uh, Wallace Sands Beach in particular. And and um, you know, and I didn't realize why. I didn't realize until now why writing this book and and telling the story would be so significant, because of um, of the uh, toxic waste that people are finding in the town of Rye. And, uh, and what I'll be talking about today in particular is rye, uh, because that's, I'm more familiar with the, uh, with the issues in rye than, than the other surrounding towns. And, and, um, and I just also wanted to share with you that uh, I've done a lot of research, and there's a lot of information, and there's a lot of conflicting information that, that I found. And so I think the best thing for me to do if, if folks are interested in, in this issue is to send you to the Rye Town Hall website. And you can just do a Google search of Rye, New Hampshire Town Hall. And uh, go to Parsons Creek Watershed. Uh, go to the planning department um, on the home page. And type, uh, click on um, Berry's Brook. And you'll find documented um, testimony of the issues that the town of Rye has had for um, with the um, with toxic waste and problems and and pollution. Um, so today I'd like to um, to read to you a uh, well actually no I think I'll change my mind I think I'm going to read from my book and talk about what you know what Rye was like back in the day and and how things have changed and and uh, and so I just want to read this to you. Um, this is the uh, prologue that I wrote. The way the story goes, in 1929, my grandfather bought a house at 1112 Ocean Boulevard for $1,500 and bought the house next door for another $1,500. My grandfather told him, my grandmother told him that was too much money to spend and made him sell one of them. Since most of the homes that existed during my childhood days had been torn down to make room for grander structures, it was important for me to write a book about those remarkable families who lived in those homes from the early 1900s to 1985, so their legacy would remain in our hearts forever. This book is a compilation of oral history from 45 different families who have either owned property, lived nearby, or spent their summer vacations at Wallace Sands Beach during that time frame. Their stories depict a time in history where there were close-knit families and neighbors taking good care of each other. These were times when a handshake could seal a business deal, times when your word was your word and integrity was foremost on your mind, a time when kids were provided the ultimate freedom to just plain be kids and eke out every second of every day being one with nature, simpler times, times that bring a smile to your face or to a tear to your eye when you reflect back. So discovering or uncovering the, the toxic waste issues, and, and it's called Coakley Landfill in particular, was, um, was extremely bothersome to me because what I realized was that, oh my goodness, you know, um, maybe those days are gone forever, you know, that, that, that I experienced, you know, growing up as a kid on the beach and having a house on the ocean for 60 years and, and, and how much that meant to us, you know, we felt safe, the water was safe, the, you know, we were out in nature, and, and, and what a beautiful place, and, and, and what a great thing that parents and grandparents were doing for their children and their grandchildren to provide them with an opportunity to uh, be one with nature, if you will. Um, so I'd like to read, it's, it's quite a, a few pages, but, but 
like I said before, there's a lot of data that people are, are, are discovering. And <clears throat> there's a lot of people saying, well, it's not our problem, whether it's the state government or the town government or the federal government. And, and I just want to kind of give you a background of uh, how long this has been a problem. Uh, this is testimony from um, residents that live nearby this Coakley landfill. And, and uh, so I'm going to read this to you. And uh, so that you, like I said, you can get a better understanding of, of the severity of the problem and how long it's actually been going on. So this is an article out of the, I took off the, uh, the web from, um, from I, I believe it was the federal government, one of their documents. This is, a, um, this is about the Northampton people who lived right nearby this landfill, Coakley Landfill is it called. They let us drink this water for 10 years before they admitted anything was in there. It's scary because what we've gone through for the last 10 years is we're stuck here with no help, says a woman who raised a family for those 10 years on, it's called Lafayette Terrace in Northampton, New Hampshire, a street ad adjacent to the Superfund site known as the Coakley Landfill. Her attitude is typical of the residents of that street who, were, who feel they were neglected and left alone to deal with the catastrophe. Originally, the Co Coakley Landfill was a sand and gravel pit. In other words, before the landfill operation began, <coughs> excuse me, the surface layer had been largely scraped away and removed. In 1971, this is 1971, the town of Northampton applied to the state of New Hampshire Bureau of, Sol Bureau of Solid Waste for a permit to use the Coakley she <coughs> site as a, sanitary, as a sanitary landfill. With the budding landowners of Jeff Sorry, when a budding landowner objected to the dump, the town of Northampton stated the landfill would be used for household refuse, refuse only. A woman living on adjacent Lafayette Terrace who requested anonymity remembers more than that was brought to the site. Helicopters used to come in by night and dump barrels, cloak and dagger. I saw them by going up there at night with a friend. The barrels were marked corrosive and had little triangles on them. It wasn't long before the residents of Lafayette Terrace began to notice problems with their water. In 1975, 1975, the first complaints were made. According to Ruth Martin, a, resident, a residence since before the landfill operation began, the water began to smell and taste bad. The water was so bad, says John Willie, another resident of the street, that you smelled worse after you took a shower. As Ruth Martin puts it, everyone in the neighborhood stunk, but they didn't realize it. They were so used to it. She also states the clothes would come out of the washing machine black. The water turned rust colored, pipes deteriorated, the washing machine, the bathroom, plumbing, all had to re be replaced because of co corrosion. About this time, John Wally's wife, Lillian, took her child to a doctor for treatment of bronchitis. Following the doctor's orders on coming home, she steamed the child in the bathroom. The child convulsed and had to be rushed to a hospital and put in a breathing apparatus. Ruth Martin reports that the first major health problem appeared in her family when her husband suffered a heart attack. When he was sent home, he was told to drink a lot of water. He soon had a brain hemorrhage and died in Mass General Hospital. When her daughter came down with a kidney infection, Ruth Martin decided to call the state to have the water tested. The state of New Hampshire replied that since it was a private well, she would have to have arranged, arranged to have it tested herself. She would also have to pay for the test. The problems continued. Ruth Martin's older daughter and all the kids in the block were often lethargic. When her older daughter was married, the family was too embarrassed to have guests come to their house. The air smelled too bad. A number of domestic pets in the neighborhood had to have litters aborted. Mice and rats were often seen convulsing in the road. Then Mrs. Martin received a telephone call from Auburn, New Hampshire, where her 32-year-old son had moved, saying that he had died of a massive heart attack. An autopsy revealed that all the young men's vital organs were three times normal size. Finally, the state of New Hampshire tested the water, but only to determine if chloroform bacteria from either humans or animals was present. The water tested negative. Because the state didn't find anything wrong, the residents of Lafayette Terrace didn't think anything was really wrong. I really believe the state would tell us if anything was wrong with the water, John Willie says. Despite the results of the test, Lillian Wiley and her neighbors began to use bottled water. The trouble was bottled water was expensive on their very moderate income. The Wileys, for instance, had nine people in their home. So they continued to bathe in the well water and to use it for cooking and washing. 
The residents were advised by an expert whom they consulted to try putting chlorine down the well. They did so. While the color of the water improved, rashes from bathing were common. Then they learned that plans to extend the municipal water system did not include supplying Lafayette Terrace. When the homeowners tried to persuade the Northampton Water Department to include their street, they were accused of dumping chemicals into their wells in order to get municipal water. Meanwhile, still thinking that the problem was bacterial, they began boiling the water, thereby possibly intensifying chemical concentrations. This is really, really long. I didn't realize how long it was going to take. Um, so I think I will... Um, I think I'll just read. Um, no, you know what? I'm just going to continue to read. Um, uh, then in 1983, a new test revealed the presence of possible carcinogens in the Lafayette Terrace water. Incredibly, the people most concerned were not officially notified. Instead, Ruth Martin, who had requested the test, was told that she could, should go around and inform her neighbors. The water department stating that there was the presence of significant levels of industrial chemicals in the water did notify the Northampton Board of Selectmen. At this time, the Water Department also urged the extension of town water to Lafayette Terrace, an order followed to shut down the contaminated wells. With no water at all, the residents tried to use local schools and fire stations for their water sources and for hygienic purposes. They were told that they could not use the public facilities, that the problem was theirs, not the town's. Only by paying between $1,200 and $1,500 per house for a temporary line did they finally get municipal water. Soon thereafter, in 19, September of 1983, now this started in 71, now we're into 1983, EPA published a new national priorities list of hazardous waste sites mandated for cleanup under Superfund. The Coakley landfill was not included. Although EPA quickly admitted, admitted its mistake, saying that the three contaminated wells had been missed by investigators sent to the Coakley landfill, the residents of Lafayette Terrace were neither impressed nor reassured. In September of 1984, a year later, a citizen's complaint was made to New Hampshire Bureau of Solid Waste. In response, a waste management engineer, Timothy Drew, was sent to investigate the site. EPA personnel also responded. Drew found a major seep had emerged with all vegetation in the area of the seep either dead or dying. Drew was empathetic, empathetic in his reaction to the situation. Access to this site needs to be discouraged immediately. As dire as the engineer's report appeared, town officials still, not, still did not seem to think that the situation was a special concern to the people most immediately affected. In a letter of 19, November 1984 from RA Southwood of the Northampton Office of the Selectmen, Ruth Martin was informed that we have polled the participants in Coakley Landfill Ad Hoc Committee, and they have denied your request to be present at our meetings. We understand your interest in the matter, but some of the others feel that your interest might possibly be, possibly intim intimidate with to others. The 1986 indoor air tests were being conducted in Lafayette Terrace's home by the New Hampshire Division of Public Health. The results showed the presence of Vox, it's called. Um, uh, and then it goes on with more statistics. but. Then in 1988 come two studies that the residents of Lafayette Terrace believed would confirm that there was substance to their complaints. One study of the Bureau of Disease Control of the New Hampshire Division of Public Health surveyed cancer incident around the Coakley landfill. The other study was a health assessment by the federal ATSDR. Both studies were conducted in 1988 and apparently shared information. The ATSDR and New Hampshire reports came to the same conclusions, no health problems. The cancer study originally requested by grassroots ag activist Martha Baylor, a member of the National Toxic Campaign Fund Board of Directors, stated at the outset that the met methodology used in the study is not capable of either proving or disproving a causal relationship between any ex specific exposure and disease. Why bother doing a study at all then, it might be asked. Basically, the state study consisted mostly of an examination of death certificates in the state of New Hampshire, thus excluding the death of anyone who had gone, for example, for example, to the nearby and renowned medical facilities in Boston. A door-to-door -door health survey using a standardized questionnaire was also conducted by the state. Ruth Martin doesn't know what good the survey did. When I saw the state health study, I couldn't believe what I was reading. 
because there was nothing to it, and that and that's what we were told then. The residents of Lafayette Terrace had higher Terrace had higher hopes for the ATSDR study. This was, after all, the federal government coming to Northampton to determine what was really happening. Since EPA had already declared the Coakley landfill a Superfund site, it followed that another federal agency would see that their health had been and was at risk. Martha Bailey comments, I'm very disappointed in the state study, and I'm even more dis disappointed in the fact that ATS did, did not do a full study, but instead performed simply an assessment. They haven't gone around and asked people about illnesses in their family or what was bothering them. The state of New Hampshire knocked on four or five doors. Lillian Wiley went around her, herself and asked her neighbors about their health problems. Her survey, her survey was the closest to a health study. ATSDR knocked on no doors at all. Instead, they used information that the state gathered. I think the federal government is covering up, concludes Martha Bailey. This area of southern Rockingham country has the highest can cancer rate in the state, but nobody is looking into why. I, um, that was a lot <laughs> to read, and that's a lot of information for you to, to try to, uh, to grasp your head around. Um, but I, uh, I was, the more I started to read about this, and, and I was really, really getting very upset and very concerned um, about how can I help, what can we do, and, and so um, I'm going to ask John to, to show a video clip now. I had uh, the pleasure of, of meeting, well, this woman actually lives in North Carolina now, but this is a video clip, and this is a, a video of Amy Potvin had uh, twin daughters. She lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and uh, one of her twins, Ellie, uh, contracted this uh, RMS, which is a rare, rare form of uh, childhood cancer. And I, uh, with her permission, I put this video clip together.
we found a home we found a home oh i love you we found a home we found a home Well, I think that video clip uh, really speaks for itself, and uh, I'm sure for some of you it was uh, probably hard to, to watch and see this beautiful uh, little girl who was having fun at the beach, and, and, uh, and, uh, and she contracted cancer, and, and, um, and now she's, um, she's a guardian angel watching over us. And, and, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, it's, um, there's no definitive way to, um, to, to prove that you know that her cancer or other people's cancers uh, were caused by um, by uh, the toxins and the contamination and the pollution at, at Wallace Sands Beach and, and in the Portsmouth Rye area, uh, but I uh, I would encourage you all to 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 get involved to become aware and 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 take good care of your children because they are our future and and it's up to us as adults to to uh, to be part of the solution and 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 keep them safe.